Big data provides insight into what people are doing on your website, while thick data tells the story behind why people do what they do. And you need both perspectives to shine a light on where your website is losing loans and deposits. You're listening to the Banking on Digital Growth Podcast. Welcome back to the Banking on Digital Growth Podcast. I'm James Robert Lay, founder and CEO of the Digital Growth Institute, where we're on a mission to help financial brands stop losing loans and deposits in less than 30 days because of unseen gaps in their marketing and sales systems. And the way that we do this is by guiding financial brands through the Banking on Digital Growth program that is comprised of three simple steps. Step number one, secret shop your website. Step number two, get your digital growth blueprint. And step number three, build your digital growth engine. However, before we guide any financial brands through these three simple steps, we start with a very easy to follow website blind spot benchmark review. And you can schedule your website benchmark review by texting benchmark to 415-579-3002. Joining me for today's conversation, our Exponential Insight series is Carlo Cardilli. Carlo is the COO at Alpha Rank, where they seamlessly and instantly integrate with your existing loan origination or account opening process to provide full funnel visibility and data-driven guidance that is guaranteed to improve your digital growth performance. Welcome to the show, Carlo. It is good to share time with you again. It's been too long. It has been too long, James. Great to be here. Thank you. And by the way, congratulations on the book. I hear it's great. It's thank on my to-do list. Well, thank you very much. And as of this morning, as of recording, um, we just celebrated Father's Day and I was getting messages and even saw a couple of people on LinkedIn post that they had gifted the book or they had received the book as a gift for Father's Day. Never in a million years would I have thought mm-hmm. I would have written a book that would have been a Father's Day gift, number one, yet alone a Father's Day gift that people are actually grateful and thankful to give or even receive because the feedback has just been, it's been great. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm happy to catch up with you because a lot has changed. A lot has changed since the last time that you and I have visited, um, since you came on the podcast last. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, before we get into changes that you're seeing, what has been going well for you? What is good so that we can always start on a positive note here? Well, you know, we are on a tear growth-wise. We've doubled revenues in 2022, doubled them in 2023. Uh, we're on track to double them again in 2024. And we got a whole bunch of new products that I'm super excited about. So uh, life has been good. And, uh, you know, we're very thankful for the fantastic relationships we have with our customers. Um on the metric side, our net revenue retention is 110%, which means that the folks that were there with us last year are now sending us more money this year. And then we've got lots of growth on top of that. So that to me is the the key metric of a healthy business. So delighted to be here. Well, I am glad that you're continuing to experience this growth. And a lot of this, I would believe, based upon what I'm seeing, but also what we were talking about before we hit record, is you're solving some very real and relevant problems. And let's get into some of those challenges that you're seeing. But first, what has changed the most since we last had a conversation on the podcast? I think the biggest change has been environmental. We transitioned from this uh, low interest rate environment, almost zero interest rates, to an environment with uh, permanently higher interest rates. And the market has had to adjust so if you're a financial institution, your cost of funds has gone up. It's gone up from almost next to nothing uh, to maybe 4 or 5%. In some cases, we see some credit unions running some crazy uh, CD specials. Mm-hmm. You know, there's uh, one we work with that just put out a 9.5 anniversary CD. It's just like stratospheric. So cost of funds is up. Uh, similarly, uh, because the interest rates have increased on consumer lending, making a profitable consumer loan, especially vehicle loan or a home equity loan or a mortgage, become much more harder as demand has diminished. So we have sort of more people fighting for shrinking share of the pie. And, you know, all that fighting is happening in the online branch, not in the physical branch. Yes. And I just want to make sure I heard you correct. That was 9.25, 9.5? 9.5. Nine. It's their 95th, 95th anniversary. So 
Uh, there's some caveats. It's a it's a five month uh, certificate, and the max is twenty five hundred bucks. But if you got twenty five hundred bucks sitting around, I'll uh, I'll tell you where you can go get nine point five percent on that. Wow. And the balance sheet is solid. It's uh, that's a that's that's incredible to think about. And you're right. Like we're you know the pie has gotten smaller. Competition has increased. Uh, and if you think about, we go back to 1994. And I, I use that as a reference point in banking on change for that matter. Here we are, 2024, 30 years later, uh, the internet, everything that we have seen transpire since then, changes in technology have led to changes in the way that we connect, the way that we communicate, the competitive landscape. But really also, I think that we undervalue this. It's the changes and the transformations of consumer beliefs that drive mm-hmm. consumer behavior. And I know it's the consumer behavior piece that you're focused on. I'm super interested in that as well as a digital anthropologist. When you look at the transformation of consumer behavior, you're providing financial brands with clarity from say a click on an ad all the way down to a close for that matter. Where Mm -hmm. might there be a lack of clarity right now, even in 2024 as the competitive landscape has changed as the way that we connect and communicate has changed as consumer beliefs and behavior has changed. The lack of clarity or the unknown could be costing financial brands millions, if not tens of millions of dollars in loans and deposits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely true. So the lack of clarity uh, typically, you know, occurs in, uh, (laughs) in uh, the uh, online part of the funnel. So, you know, folks will talk about conversions and they'll talk about conversion rates of this and that. And uh, you, you just ask me a few questions like, well, what exactly are you defining as a conversion? And it'll turn out that maybe an agency will come and say, well, you know, conversion means that they uh, click through the landing page. Yeah. And, and then what? Or they might say, well, conversion means that they got into the application. Uh, rarely they'll say that conversion means that they hit the submit button on the application. But even that, that's not a conversion. Uh, because if you got to hit the submit button, you know, if the assistant comes back and says, you know, congratulations, you've been automatically declined, mm. that doesn't count. Uh, you have to be able to pick up that breadcrumb, James, and follow it through all the way uh, through the offline process that happens. So if you submitted, and the application was complete and everything was there uh, for, let's say, this checking account. Um, the financial institution now has to make a decision. Am I going to accept that application? These folks are being flooded today with uh, hordes of synthetic fraud, right? Mm-hmm. You know, I can go on, uh, you know, chat GPT 4.0 and create a very, very convincing sort of fake driver's license a very, very convincing uh, fake selfie. Challenge anybody to, you know, detect that. And unless you have these, you know, protections, you're going to get this flood of applications, some of them good, some of them bad. I might have a terrible qualifier. I might have a 450 rating because, you know, I defaulted on a bunch of stuff. So you have to make a decision as to whether to accept me or not. And then if you accept me, then the money has to change hands. And if the money doesn't change hands, it's like, it's honestly like coming second in poker, right? You fired all these chips and congratulations, you're second and you you win nothing. So uh, super, super important to get that essentially that last mile connection all the way to dollars on the balance sheet. Because uh, look, I think you made this point in one of your articles, you know, brand marketers are um, slowly losing ground, uh, getting fired, if you will, at these financial institutions and then be replaced by growth marketers. Why? Because the CEOs and the CFOs are looking at these backend reports and they're looking at dollars on the balance sheet. You know, what came in, uh, in deposits and loans, and they want to see those numbers move. And if you can't move those numbers, uh, then you know they're going to say congratulations and off to the next um, um, sort of marketing uh, leader to try and shift those numbers. And ultimately, that's the metrics of success. Can you grow the business? Can you get deposits and loans flowing in? I want to loop back because you're touching on a pain point that we often see uh, within the buying journey. We'll just start with the click. Uh, And Mm -hmm. I know, for example, with third-party cookies and the whole challenge there, uh, the agency space and even the digital Mm -hmm. ad space, I've spoken out on, you know, 
and it depends upon who you're talking, looking at the different data and the different research, but upwards of 60, 70, sometimes even 80% of even those clicks, those clicks could be fraudulent for that mm -hmm. matter. And so if, if an agency is reporting, we got you all of these clicks, my response to that is, so what? Mm -hmm. How did that translate into actual traffic to the site? How did that traffic translate into an actual click on an apply button? How did that apply button translate into a completed application, which is not to mm -hmm. your point, not a conversion? How did that completed application translate all the way down to funded and closed or closed and funded? Um, because mm -hmm. there's so mm -hmm. many different off ramps that we're losing opportunity. Now, if we can mm -hmm. take this and maybe break this down piece by piece, bite by bite, where do you see the biggest gaps at a macro level within a buying journey? Because you have a lot of competitive and benchmark data sets to fall back mm -hmm. on here. Mm -hmm. So, um, wow, where to start? So the uh, the place to start is. Uh, um, looking at landing pages. So if you were working with us, we automatically run a scan of the whole website and we measure every single page on the website and measure how that page relates to getting people into the application. Because if you can't get people to start the application, uh, you just lost, right? It's like you you tripped on the way to, to the plate. You never get to bat. <laughs> You're done. Um, when you look at landing pages, uh, you'll find that sometimes these landing pages have sort of terrible performance. Uh, I often see landing pages that have single digit percentage. So for 100 people that end up on this landing page, you know, less than 10 uh, get to account opening or to loan origination. And that, frankly, is a failure. Mm -hmm. You know, good landing page of good traffic should be in the 30s, maybe in the 40s uh, of percent. So you see, OK, so we got we know there's a problem. Our software flags it. Now we have to go break it down. Uh, then we get into you know the, what we call it like the what happened mode on this page, and uh, at that point you you segment the traffic in that page. Some of the traffic will be organic. Some of them will be people uh, who came in through Google search um, that you didn't pay for. Some of them through Google searches that you paid for. Uh, some of them might you know come from a programmatic platform like Display, or they might come from Facebook. And you look at all these differential traffic sources. And then you look at what they did, you know, what happened next? Yeah. Did they click the thing that we wanted them to click? Did they get lost and click on the sidewide navigation? Uh, did they just bounce? And one of the things we look at is depth of click. So somebody who just comes in uh, and just loads the page and does nothing, um, you know, that's, you know, presumptively a bad traffic source. You know, that could be click fraud. So uh, by looking at the depth of the click and looking at different sources, you can start making uh, some assessment of what's really happening. Uh, so typically, your best traffic is going to be the folks that do uh, Google searches that are intent specific. Mm -hmm. So if I'm Googling for you know best checking account in Kansas City, I'm you know I have high intent. I get that person into the flow, and we can see it through the data that they that's specifically the search they put in. You know, that's the canary in the coal mine. Yeah. If that click goes through, we know the landing page is good. And therefore, the, all the other clicks that didn't make it through, this is just, they're just bad clicks. Uh, the other thing you look at is also time of day patterns. Um, you know, the peak time for applying for a checking account is typically between uh, 10 o'clock and noon, whatever local time is. And then there's another peak in, in the early afternoon uh, to early evening. Uh, but then it kind of tails off the real clicks yeah. and we'll see sometimes some programmatic sources and there's like clicks coming in at two, 3 a.m. on a Sunday night. You know, that's, that's, that's junk traffic. Correct. You know, a real human doesn't behave that way. Uh, you look at, you know, how long is it taking them through navigate through the application? You know, somebody speed running the application and gets a deposit application finished in under 30 seconds. That is not a human. That's a bot. Yep. And there's, so there's lots of metadata like that that help us, uh, score the quality of these clicks and you know uh, and then of course you have to look at what they did afterwards uh, because uh, sometimes these speed runners <laughs> you get you get lots of applications and they all get you know declined in the back because they're not they're not real right i appreciate how we're for lack of a better word picking apart the landing page regardless of what the product mm -hmm. is at this point and because there's just 
pattern matching. Um, and mm-hmm. what you're looking at is the big. Well, data. I mean, you know, that, that is, you just summarized the whole of machine learning and artificial intelligence. It's <laughs> pattern matching, right? And I think and it's what hum- humans have been doing for years. We just are training machines to do it better than us now. Well, and, 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 and you're hundred percent correct. It's, we have been pattern matching from the time I want to say we're about one to three months old is when we really begin to establish patterns as an infant. And it's those mm-hmm. patterns that we begin to build upon and create our own levels of intelligence. To, but back to your point, artificial intelligence and machine learning, it's the same thing, except at a much more higher level of efficiency and be able to, to see things and perceive things that our little linear minds aren't able to. So with that in mind, the pattern matching here, um, you're looking at the big data set, what people mm-hmm. are doing. I wrote about this in Banking on Digital Growth, big data versus thick data. Big data is the what. Where might thick data, so smaller data set, more qualitative, not quantitative, like what you're looking at. How, mm-hmm. how do you blend the two together to where you have the big data set into what people are doing? The thick data set informs more of why people are doing what they're that's, doing. That's, that's, that's exactly right. So if you think about these, you know, the, all these sort of, you know, large language models that have taken over the world, you know, they start doing, sometimes they'll, you know, give you sort of counterintuitive uh, explanations. And then you have to sort of dig in and attack it from first principles. Yeah. So uh, let's just say we come up, we score this landing page, we tell you it's not working well, we'll tell you why it's not working well. You will still need the thick data. You'll still need the visual experience. Uh, you'll, If you're a marketer and you're being told this landing page doesn't work and you got to replace it with something that does work, you still have to go look at it yourself. Experience yourself, put yourself in the shoes of that prospect and then, you know, we'll give you, hey, here's a landing page from another one of our customers. And this one is in the top, you know, 5% of all landing pages. And then you look at the thick data from that experience and you immediately get it. So it's like, yeah, okay, these are the problems I'm having. I got the sidewind navigation, I got to get rid of, you know, you know, I've got these color schemes. I got these things that are going on. And this other landing page that works really well for a credit union that looks just like me, I have a completely different experience. I get there, it's crisp, it's tight. You know, there's one thing to do, one call to action, click, I'm in, and it works. And it's once you experience that thick data, then you can uh, take it. And then when you get something back from the agency, you'll be able to say, yeah, this is exactly what we need to put in market. Or, you know, this is not going to do it because I have now that background of experience. Uh, so that's where the human factor comes in, being able to just you know, process the experience. Because at the end of the day, you know, these landing pages are going to be for other humans to interact with. Right. Well, and I think you're the human factor. It's something that I'm I'm very interested in because it's, it's, it's looking to match the patterns of people. And that's what we Mm -hmm. do when we facilitate website secret shopping studies. But a lot of this, and you've used the word experience. I think we have to inform those watching and listening, at least from the vernacular of the digital growth Institute, we define experience as a well-defined system and process that has been strategically mm-hmm. thought out, applied, and then the secret is continuously optimized over time through a blend of quantitative and qualitative data or big and thick data. Um, mm-hmm. I'm even going back to one of my early readings on this. It was a book published on January 1st, 2005 by Steve Krug. Don't make mm-hmm. me think. The subtitle was A Common Sense Approach to Web Usability. And so- Oh my goodness. <laughs> you know, we, you know, our, our internal vernacular sometimes when we talk to our clients says, look, you're making this application, you know, into an IQ test. That's you know, right. you're asking this question. I got to decode. There was one today on, on courtesy pay we're looking at. It's like, seriously, you know, I can't figure out what this says. What, what are you asking them to do? Should I, should I check the box and not check the box? Right. Oh, wait, I can't continue unless I check the box. I'm going to check it, but I don't really know what I agreed to. So I think, I think you're absolutely right. It should not be an IQ test. And, uh, um, you know, there's another aspect here about experience that is not talked about all that much. The uh, the application process is often viewed by the financial institution as one way. Here, come in. You want to check an account, fill in all these forms, uh, all these data points, then we'll make a decision. Mm. What you should be thinking about is that the prospect is simultaneously processing all that information and making a decision. Opening a checking account is actually a commitment. Um you know, we know that checking account velocity is not great. You open a checking account, you'll be with that financial institution for say five, seven years. Yeah. So 
emotionally, if you're making a five to seven year commitment and you are evaluating as a prospect, the experience in real time. Yeah. And if you see something that is clunky or like the bump page that says, you know, abandon all hope you who enter, uh, <laughs> Or you get something that feels like, you know, 1995, you're immediately going to project that experience because, you know, you're, you're pattern matching. It's like, uh, I'm experiencing this now, what it's going to be like when I'm trying to do the bill pay, you yeah. know, what it's going to be like when I have a problem, uh, what's going to be like when my debit card stops working, is my debit card going to stop working? You know, this like kind of fear spirals up. Sure. So you need to give them a tight, efficient experience. Because they will project that onto the future relationship, and uh, you know that's where they might just go. You know what? This is this just feels like 1995. I'm not going to do business with these guys. It's just too antiquated. Here, let me go over to Chime because I was watching the NBA Finals, and you know I see Chime all over the place. They uh, that's got to be a decent brand. Let me go with them. Right? That's that's the other part that simultaneously as the financial institution evaluating the prospect the prospect is evaluating you. Yes. And to the point of we have rethought over the last maybe 12 to 18 months. And a lot of it came from writing banking on change because while banking mm -hmm. on change was written to help guide financial brands through turbulent times, through difficult times, through times of exponential change, the same principles of human transformation can be applied mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. digital experiences. It can be applied to financial coaching and guiding people through financial journeys. But we're looking at the traditional buying journey of awareness, consideration, purchase, adoption, and advocacy. And there's different mm -hmm. models and frameworks, but that's the one that we stick to. Now mm -hmm. there's an emotive component that we've added. The majority of people enter into a buying journey feeling some level of confusion, a financial buying journey for that matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I wrote about this in Banking on Digital Growth, like it's cognitive load. And so there's three right. different types of cognitive load. And when you get to the application specifically, and even before you get to the application, we have to consider the paradox of choice um, and mm -hmm. where choice, uh, great TED Talk, great book on the subject for that matter. But step number one is to transform confusion into clarity, mm -hmm. clarity into courage, courage into commitment, back to your point here. But just because one commits, and when we look at the commitment, that means they get through the application process. Mm -hmm. We're not done. That's where we have to transform commitment into confidence and mm -hmm. affirm and then reaffirm that, yes, you made the right decision. I think about one financial brand that we've recently taken through our digital growth blueprint process. They do not even begin talking about mobile banking and getting the adoption there until day five or seven. Compare mm -hmm. that to the Chime experience, the very first step in the Chime experience, and we've sh shopped that experience multiple times, and they continuously are optimizing it, which is the third yep. step of, yep. of experience. Chime is getting people into the app and getting money into the account within minutes. I mean, that's like the first call to action post-conversion, post-approval. And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. transform, transform that, that, that commitment into confidence. And then the last step is to transform confidence into a sense of community. because what are we all working for towards here is, is to, to increase our financial well-being. Um, and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if we're doing that as a cohort, as a group, as a community, the likelihood of success begins to increase. Um, there's the old African proverb, if you want to go far or if mm -hmm. you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So right. coming back to the simplicity here, based upon the patterns that you have matched, what are very specific ways to simplify what for many times is a very complex experience once someone clicks the apply button, gets into the application? What are some of the patterns that you're seeing there that could well, be Well, you know, the it's interesting you bring up the paradox of choice, but that's another place where uh, we go to war constantly, you know, because a lot of financial institutions will have a lot of products. Yeah. You know, I've got, you know, four or five different checking account products. I got three different savings accounts. I got all this other stuff. and um, what we come back to is like, look, what is the tip of your speed of product? What product do you think is best for these people? Mm -hmm. And if it's a, uh, if it's a checking account that maybe uh, doesn't have certain, um, uh, certain quote unquote privileges uh, because you're credit challenged and that's what, that's what these folks in, that's what you put them into. Uh, Cause one of the biggest problems is I give you the smorgasbord 
uh, we see the data where people are now like looking at this thing. It's like, well, which one of these things do I want? I got to make a choice. And, you know, I, I don't know. I, you know. I got FOMO. And so if you just simply narrow it down to just one thing here, click here, you know, this is the checking account for you. Let's go. Um, it greatly sort of speeds up the process and greatly speeds up the completion rate. And the second thing that you want to avoid as a financial institution marketer is having people apply for the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're credit challenged and your qualifile is sub 500, then a confidence checking account is the right product for you. You know, you're not going to be able to get that, you know, fancy, you know, rewards dividend checking account. Mm -hmm. You're just not going to get approved. Likewise, um, one of our clients has a black credit card that, is getting a ton of applications and people really want that because the rewards are fantastic. Problem is, you know, you need a 725 or better to get that card. So putting that card in the Schmorgel board of choices for people that don't qualify is just a you know plainly bad idea. Uh, it gets worse because this card is being marketed to existing members of this credit union. And it's a, just a bad brand experience. Yeah. Uh, I see it in mobile banking. Hey, apply for the black card. Yeah, sure. Look, click. Oh, I'm a uh, single sign on to the application. Great. Everything's pre-filled. Fantastic. You know, give me the, give me the black card. And then it comes back three years later and uh, you've been declined, but how about this other card that I didn't want? Right. Uh, and as a member, you know, especially in the credit union space, you know, I, I'm a sort of a uh, fractional owner yeah. of this cooperative. Right. I've done everything you asked me to do. And then you just kicked me in the pants and I'm not good enough. That's just a terrible experience. So uh, the uh, the key, especially the cross sale, is really good matching of the product to the existing member or the existing uh, customer and make sure that they you're, you're giving them one thing, the one thing that meets their need and the one thing that they qualify for and just make it super simple. You know, something else. And I really appreciate that because it's it's experience it's the experience expectation gap um mm -hmm. i have an expectation going into an experience but when that experience falls short or i don't get the expected outcome that's when the frustration and that negative feeling that negative emotion begins to set in something else i want to uh, touch on here and and we have seen this as well and it's not rocket science um when you ask for one piece of information per screen mm -hmm. if we're thinking about an application at this point. So instead of asking for five or 10 or sometimes mm -hmm. 15, 20 different entry points of data on an intake form, whether right. it's desktop or mobile, we distill that down. We simplify it and we ask for one, one piece of information for one screen. And then we click next, next, next. And we show the progress bar. We mm -hmm. see a higher propensity, or, 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 or don't show the progress bar. Actually, don't show the progress bar. See, I'm even learning something new <laughs> here, um, and that's the thing. Uh, well, last time, last time you took a, a say a survey, um, if you fly United or Southwest, uh, which are my main carriers, you get a survey all the time. So you know, I like to secret shop what the other industries are doing. That never show your progress bar. Don't show the progress bar. Yeah, right. Because if you show the progress bar. And it's like, man, I already answered three questions and I'm only 11% into this thing. Demotivated. Like, oh, for, yeah. Forget it. Right. Yeah. But if I don't show the progress bar, yeah, you know, I, I won't, you know, I was like, okay, maybe it's just one more question. Fine. Keep going. One of the things is abandoned applications. We mm -hmm. have been working on this problem for my goodness, a decade. And it's still mind blowing a decade later. Why? why there are organizations that haven't even addressed this. So let's just get first name, last name, email address, phone number. And then no, no. less, less, less email, email or phone number. Yeah. Now, phone number is a little tricky because although phone number is the best way to text is the best way to reconnect, you know, text, texting somebody about, you know, an application, they might like, ah, eh, who is this person? I don't, I don't, you know, is this a scam attempt? Yeah. Email, very, very safe because the email is going to come from the email domain of the bank or credit union. So, uh, and it's going to be branded. It's going to have a logo as opposed to text that is just text. So um, we have started, secret, one, we have started secret. There's shop. one thing. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. If there's one thing, just grab their email address on the way in, uh, monitor their progress. If they've abandoned, 
um, email them. I mean, that's what e-commerce does, right? Mm-hmm. You know, um, <laughs> I'm all amped up about, uh, you know, the upcoming snow season. And uh, yeah, if I even look at a snowboard, I know I'm going to get an email from uh, from Evo yeah. you know, within 24 hours saying, hey, it's still here. It's like, uh, you know, it, you know it, we're selling out. It's like, it's, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a great thing. And uh, we think we call it a rebound because it's, it is what it is, right? It's like playing basketball. You, you put up the ball, it doesn't go in. You want to go rebound and take a second shot. Uh, so, but also you have to be a good shooter because if you, if you, if you're a bad shooter and you keep rebounding, well, it's not going to help you because you, you're going to keep missing. So two things go hand in hand. You want a great application that people can complete at a high percentage all the time. And then the people that don't complete it for whatever reason, you want to be back in there within 24 hours Yeah. because look, these products at the end of the day, um, you only need one, mm-hmm. right? They're not like sneakers that you can have a whole collection of sneakers and Hey, I'm going to go, you know, go to a nightclub. So I'm going to wear this pair. <laughs> you know, these are transactional products. So you need, you know, one checking account, maybe two, one credit card where you concentrate, uh, your rewards. Um, you're buying a car. You need one car loan, not two, not three, one. Yeah, buying a house, one mortgage. So uh, it's a winner take all, and uh, you just, you know, if you're in the consideration and they're looking at you and they're looking at your process and you want to be back in there because if they don't do business with you, they will do business with somebody else and then they'll be out of the market for the duration of that product. Checking be out of the market five to seven years. Vehicle loan out of the market three to five years. Mortgage out of the market possibly forever. Yeah. So. Well, I have I have seen through the some of the secret shoppings and the competitive benchmarking that we've been doing, particularly on the more complex products like mortgage, home equity, um, small to mid sized business loans, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the abandoned application methodology from the neo and the digital lenders, they are now actively doing outbound calls for those that do abandon. I don't have the data to say you know what, that, that positively influences a decision one way or another. It is a differentiator. Um, I think of one and I, and I can't recall the brand off the top of my head, but they were in the, um, home improvement space and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. they were calling and emailing over the course of 45 days. It wasn't an obnoxious amount, but in, mm-hmm. and it wasn't one of the, like the ghost voicemails that just drops in your phone. It was an actual ring and then a voicemail and it was tied to CRM mm-hmm. and you, you could see that they mm-hmm. were managing progress. But I will tell you just on the email alone, we have seen organizations that have implemented the abandoned application or the pre-app system that, that we teach on the deposit side, they recapture at the lower end of the spectrum around 5% of abandoned apps. And mm-hmm. when I say recapture, so we're not looking at all the way to funding. But it'd be interesting to see that flow all the way to funding. But we do know that there, yes, was a completed application there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then on the deposit, uh, on, the, on the loan side, the abandon of the pre-app system can recapture 20 to 25, upwards of 30%. And mm-hmm. I think because there's more of a need, there's more of a need, like I need a loan for X, Y, or mm-hmm. Z. So there's there's that bit of psychology that comes into play. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, our data lines up with that sort of perfectly. Uh, what, especially for the, uh, you know, the I need it now products, vehicle loans in particular. Yeah. So you know, some of these are more discretionary than others, you know, home Correct. equity. Yeah. You know, if I don't need one today, I could get one next week. You know, mortgages take forever as you know, uh, but vehicle loans in particular, those are driven by urgency. Yeah. Uh, somebody is shopping for a vehicle loan. So that means they've, you know, opted out essentially of dealer financing uh, or, uh, automotive financing. Mm-hmm. So they're not going to go with the sort of captive finance arms. So they're, they're shopping yep. um, and they have a vehicle in mind and they want to get the deal done. Um, it's not quite as uh, urgent now as it used to be, but a year ago, you know, if you didn't have your financing lined up, that thing was going to get sold right under your nose. Yep. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it's, and, uh, and, and we see, funny you mentioned the peak day for vehicle uh, loan originations is a Monday. So it tells you that people were out there walking the lots, looking at cars, Saturday, Sunday, right. Monday morning, you know, time to get that loan yep. and to close the deal. So, and getting back uh, to those people with a fast decision. Yes. Uh, obviously the people who abandoned, you want to have outreach. Um, you can call them, but you know, most people don't answer the phones these days, uh, but they will look at their email. Yep. So the, I think the combination of multi-channel is key. 
Uh, the second piece is how quickly can you respond? Yeah. And uh, uh, we ha- we're working with one institution and part of this uh, whole journey was, you know, how can we minimize the time from the submission to the approval with an automated response? And uh, we had somebody from their operations saying, well, you know, the, your metrics are skewed. And I go, why are they skewed? Well, it's because they include the weekend and, you know, we're not open over the weekend. And I go, yeah, and your prospect doesn't care. Right. You know, if they applied on a Friday, it's not reasonable for you to wait until a Monday to give them an answer. Yes. You know, you, Ally Bank doesn't sleep. Yeah, you know, the, the, Rocket Mortgage doesn't sleep. They don't care. They're 24 7 operations. And that point on time is something that Jay Bear and I discussed. He wrote a book called The Time to Win How to Exceed Your Customer's Need for Speed. Uh, I think about Top Gun. Uh, and the mm-hmm. Maverick and Goose, I feel the need, the need <laughs> for speed. Uh, but we do, we but, do, man. But but he says today, two out of three customers say that speed is more important than price, and it's expectation setting. Once again, come back to bring this conversation full circle. Technology has transformed mm-hmm. those three things. It's transformed the way that we connect and communicate. It's transformed the competitive landscape, and it's transformed right. beliefs that drive behaviors. As we start to wrap up here, mm-hmm. Carlo. What is one thing that someone who is watching or listening can do to practically improve, optimize their buying journey to gain more clarity into where they might be losing opportunity today? Where do they start? Well, (laughs) other than working with us, I would simply say uh, you could do your own secret shopping. They could work with us. They could work with you. They could work with both of us. Uh, But very simply, you know, uh, you're a financial institution, you know, dump uh, a simple search, not don't search for yourself, but search for the product. So mm-hmm. vehicle loans in, I don't know, uh, Leavenworth, Kansas, let's say, right. See what comes up, yeah. see where you rank on that page. If you don't rank, you got to be ranking. Now let's assume that, you know, that you ranked on that page. You might have an entry of the organic or paid click on it. Count how many clicks it's going to take to get from that first expression of buying intent to a completed application. And just, and then think long and hard about just how big that number is. It's going to be you know somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 40 clicks if you've not optimized it. So that is 30 to 40 opportunities that you give somebody to walk away. It's a great, great way to wrap things up here, Carlo. What's the great way for someone to reach out, connect with you, say hello, and continue the conversation we've started here today? I'm very active on LinkedIn, so they can find me at uh, Carlo Cordilli on LinkedIn, uh, or just go to alpharank.ai. Be happy to talk and, you know, get into the guts of the data with anyone, anytime. We love this space. Connect with Carlo, learn with Carlo, grow with Carlo. Carlo, thanks again for joining me for another episode yeah, of Bank. It's been fantastic. Podcast. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Have a wonderful weekend. As always, and until next time, be well, do good, and be the light. <laughs>